<laughs> All right. Welcome. Back in my younger adult years before I had kids, I had a friend. <laughs> Anybody remember those days? I had a friend, just one. Uh, a guy named Scott, he was a general contractor, very knowledgeable guy. He and I were both young, both ambitious. So we decided to start a business buying old rundown houses and fixing them up and then reselling them for a profit. I had the business smarts. He had the knowledge of what needed to be done. It seemed like the perfect deal. When we acquired our first property, we arranged for a day to go in and clean it out. Now, when I say clean it out, I'm not talking about windexing the countertops and and uh, getting rid of some trash. We're talking about truly cleaning out a really nasty, rundown house. Uh, dumpster time, a rollout dumpster, bit one of the big ones, the size of my current house. There were dry rotted floorboards, the drywall was stained and broken, and uh, by the end of that one day, uh, we had the house pretty much down to subfloor and the frames for most of the walls. Uh, the fixtures had to be taken out. It was a big, big project. So this house, which had taken months, I'm sure, to build, we had unbuilt in a day. <laughs> now, I'll be the first to admit I know nothing about construction. I learned quite a bit that summer, actually. Uh, but I had no idea what I was doing, what needed to be done in a, in a house like this. I knew how to put the deal together. But my friend Scott put a reticulating saw, it's called a sawzall, it's basically a tool of destruction, in my hands and said, go to town. <laughs> Despite my lack of skill and knowledge, he set me loose on this house and tearing it down was easy. Required no skill, no knowledge, no wisdom, it just required the, the sawzall. So, uh, and a lot of muscle, I was tired at the end of that day. <laughs> Does anyone know what the most powerful muscle in the body is, by the way? <laughs> ah, you guys cheated. You read, the <laughs> you read the bulletin. The tongue. And although I didn't use my tongue to demolish, they call it demo. It was demo day. I didn't use my tongue to demolish this house. There was an analogy or a parable, if you will, in this story uh, to life in that experience. Tearing down things is easy and requires no skill, very little knowledge, and very little wisdom. Uh, just some muscle. The same is true of people, tearing down people. Only you don't need a powerful saw to tear down people. Just one muscle. James talked a lot about the tongue, and so today our main reading is in James chapter 3, verses 2 through 10. For we all stumble in many things, if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, also able to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth, Proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. I like how he begins, for we all stumble in many things. Isn't it true? <laughs> I know it is for me. 
But James poses an interesting hypothesis in verse 2. In fact, it's not a hypothesis. It's not a theory. It's a God-breathed truth. If we could perfect only one area of our walk, our speech, then we would be able to bridle all the rest. We'd be able to take control of all the other areas of our lives. Everything else, he says. You see, brothers and sisters, for all the good that we try to do as Christians, for all the commandments we try to follow, for all of the church services, meetings, and Bible studies we might attend, and despite all of our good intentions, we have to glorify God in our daily lives, and the tongue, the most powerful muscle, can undo all of that good, all of the things that we do. See, earlier in his letter, James points out that no amount of religiosity can overcome the power of the tongue. James 1.26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Ouch. Useless. What he's saying here and in our main reading today is that bridling the tongue is of primary importance to us as Christians. It's the most important thing in our spiritual walk. He's saying that in order to walk in any of the Lord's ways, you have to first learn how to use that shifty little muscle in our mouth. Why? Well, it's not because it's actually physically the strongest muscle in the body. But Pastor Greg, you said, I know. <laughs> but I said it's the most powerful muscle. The strongest muscle is probably the gluteus maximus. Uh, and we do make jokes about people talking with that muscle too. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is the it's not the tongue itself. It's the words that those tongues shape. It's the words that come out of our mouths that are powerful. Words are powerful. Words can stir up emotions. Words can lift hearts, heal hurts, bring forgiveness. Words can give instruction, pardon crimes, and guide the building of anything that can be built. Words can also destroy. They can hurt. They can destroy friendships, break hearts, break spirits. Words can launch armies and navies. And... Words can lead people away from God. James uses better sermon illustrations than I could come up with. The first, and he's used it twice now in both the James readings we've done, is the bridling of a horse. Any riders here? Anyone here ride horses? Got a few. You can climb up on a horse bareback, and you can try to control the horse by grabbing onto its mane, and sometimes you'll even get where you're going, and if it's a cooperative horse, you might do okay. But if you take a bridle, a small little bar of metal to put into the horse's mouth with a little gentle tug of the reins, you can get that horse to do whatever you want it to do. You can move a 1,600-pound animal wherever you want it to go. I also like James's analogy of the ship. A good-sized sailing vessel in James's day, and this took a little research, <laughs> would have weighed at least a couple of tons, all right, four to 6,000 pounds for a good-sized sailing vessel. And just ask anyone in the Carolinas this weekend how powerful winds and waves can be. So picture a giant ship on that kind of winds and waves, yet a skilled sailor can use the rudder of the ship, a small board, which is a tiny fraction of the size of the ship, to change the course of that huge ship in almost any weather. Now, I don't want to make light of the situation in Carolina. I hope that they are all in all of your prayers. I know they're in mine. But with these two small examples, we see that it doesn't take much to change the course of something big, like a horse, or a ship, or a life. Proverbs 18.21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruits. William George Jordan, a Christian author in the late 1800s, once wrote, There are pillows wet by sobs. There are noble hearts broken in the silence whence comes no cry of protest. 
There are gentle, sensitive natures seared and warped. There are old-time friends separated and walking their lonely way with hope dead and memory but a pang. There are cruel misunderstandings that make all life look dark. These are but a few of the sorrows that come from the crimes of the tongue. And those, conse- those are the consequences that are easy for you and me to understand. We get that. We understand how someone's feelings could be hurt, how we could lose the people that are closest to us, never talk to them again. Words cause emotional impact, sure. But Proverbs didn't say happiness and sadness are in the power of the tongue. It said death and life. How many wars, how many fights, how many murders, and how many suicides have been set off by a few words? And I believe that Solomon, when sharing God's proverb there, didn't mean just physical death either. The tongue has the power to lead people towards Jesus Christ or away from him. The tongue, which in our fallen state is inherently evil, can lead people into the fiery pit. Proverbs 15, 1 through 4 A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge rightly, but the mouths of fools pours forth foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. A wholesome tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. I love that one, perverseness, lying, gossip, hateful speech, angry words, insults, judgmentalism. It's foolishness, says Solomon. In my experience uh, as a counselor, I learned an interesting fact about our human psychology. Did you know that the subconscious mind cannot differentiate between sarcasm and reality? How is that relevant, you ask? (laughs) Because Solomon mentions that words can break the spirit. James, in our reading, even likens it to a forest fire and then to eternal fire. So the problem with our subconscious mind, spiritually and psychologically, is that as we speak, so we begin to believe. The things that we say become the things that we believe. Likewise, the things we say influence other people just as they are influencing us. My kids and their friends, great example, seem to be going through a phase of it's cool to call each other by derogatory names. That's, that's the trend right now. That's what all the kids are doing. Somebody said that earlier today. Everybody's doing it. They call each other really kind of nasty, mean, spirited names, and that's the cool thing. So I called one of our daughters out on it the other day. And she said, I know, but we know we're joking. Well, maybe. Your subconscious doesn't, though. You consciously might know that you're joking, but your subconscious is another story. Have enough people call you fat enough times, you're going to start struggling with body image. Even if you laugh it off, even if you know they're joking, repeat it enough times, you're going to start worrying about your self-image. Have enough people call you stupid or ugly. Enough times you're going to struggle with your self-esteem. What you, uh, so what do you think it does to someone else when you talk badly to them? When you call them names? Talk about them. What do you think it does to other people when you belittle, insult, judge, accuse, or condemn them? Joking or not? The tongue, as James pointed out, is an unruly beast, full of poison and the potential for great evil. The words that we speak have tremendous power either to lift up and encourage or to tear down and dishearten. The words that we speak have tremendous power either to comfort 
and heal or to injure and to crush. The words that we speak have tremendous power either to praise and to worship or to blaspheme and betray. And just like we try to tame the other beasts in our lives, we must expend tremendous effort and energy trying to tame the tongue. Because as I learned that summer doing fix and flip real estate deals, <laughs> tearing things down is easy and requires no knowledge, no skill, no wisdom. Just like being casual and careless with our words is easy and requires no skill, knowledge, and certainly no wisdom. We don't have to work hard to become gossips or to be like sheep and adopt the, lo the popular, slangy, sarcastic, insulting, cruel ways that the world likes to speak. We don't have to work hard at becoming sarcastic, judgmental, negative in our speech. Washington Irving, the American author of uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, uh, once said that a sharp tongue is the only sharp tool that grows sharper with each use. <laughs> Doesn't take an effort. You don't have to work at it. It becomes more natural the more you do it. You see, as fallen beings, evil speaking comes naturally to us. The most natural thing in the world is to gossip. The most natural thing in the world is to have that sharp retort. Because if we're unregenerated, unsanctified by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us, through the grace and the gift that Jesus Christ offers us, the things that come out of our mouth are going to reflect the things in our hearts and our minds. The things that come out of our mouths are going to reflect what we really think and feel. Just as Jesus taught when he rebuked the Pharisees, Matthew 12, 34. Brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's calling them out. They claim piety, claim religiosity, yet their hearts are filled with evil. So how could good come out of their mouth? Notice the word abundance there. Perisiumatos in Greek, perisiumatos, abundance, which means that which fills the majority of. There's an abundance of evil in the heart. In other words, there's more evil than good in their hearts. If your tongue is speaking evil, if you're gossiping, if you're ill-speaking, if you're wishing ill on someone, if you're insulting, if you're rumor-mongering, Jesus himself is teaching us that it means that your heart is filled with more evil than it is good. Abundance. So how, asks Jesus, can we expect to speak good things? James points out the hypocrisy there too. In verses 9 and 10 of our main reading today, ever hear the old expression when somebody says a particularly nasty swear word, you kiss your mother with that mouth? Anyone ever heard that? That's one I used to get <laughs> when I'd swear when I was a teenager. You kiss your mother with that mouth? James is asking that question, verses 9 and 10. He's asking it, I think, in a more meaningful way. Do you pray to your heavenly Father with that mouth? Mm, right? <laughs> powerful, powerful reminder, really? You're going to pray to God and then say the things that you're saying? We ought not to pray and curse with the same mouth he finishes an unknown poet once wrote <clears throat> only a word of anger but it wounded one sensitive heart only a word of sharp reproach but it made the teardrops start only a hasty thoughtless word sarcastic and unkind but it darkened the day before so bright and left a sting behind only a word of kindness but it lightened one heart of its grief. Only a word of sympathy, but it brought one soul relief. Only a word of gentle cheer, but it flooded with radiant light, the pathway that seemed so dark before, and it made the day more bright. We have, with this little but most powerful muscle, the power to praise, to pray, 
to glorify, to lift up, to encourage, even to heal. We also have the power to wound, to crush, to stir up anger and violence, to become a stumbling block to other people and even to ourselves. I learned many summers ago that I could tear down a house, but without knowledge, wisdom, discipline, the right tools, I had no idea how hard it was to build one back up again. Likewise, it takes work to bridle the tongue. It takes practice to master your speech. It takes catching yourself when you fall short, reminding yourself of this sermon, and then trying again until you get into the habit of mastering your tongue. It takes discipline and commitment to hold your tongue but it is, according to James, the secret to Christ's perfection. So I finish my sermon with the principle and the measuring stick by which we should all start that bridling process. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers that it may build up, not tear down, and impart grace to those who hear it, and grace to all of us. Amen. Oh, let's get the worship team back.